project happen. And it's a project that has been in the making for over a year, and that started with uh, some people that are here right now and some of the people who are not here right now. But um, right now we have all of you here, and we have people from, from really all over the world. We have people from China who came all the way here. Um, 
we are focusing on the Chinese labor market. We do a lot of campaign and also we are working as some kind of a labor life watchdog. And we write reports in English and Chinese and we publish it publicly. Um, so in the national media departments and also um, the
even removed right of strike from the Constitution in 1982 to prevent any uh, unrest caused by the workers because of this economic reform. Um, so at that time, it uh, invited a lot of uh, foreign investments, mainly from Hong Kong, where I came from, and also Taiwan. And in 2001, uh, China joined the government's own and then it further opened the market to direct foreign investment. Um, so uh, since then, the government seems to be key growth as a, a, a kind of indicator of political achievement. So who are the pillars uh, behind this kind of um, Chinese glory or China's success? It's the kind of people called migrant workers. So I, I, I have prepared a uh, video by the economists. And if you can uh, explain a little bit about the internal migration of migrants in China. So, yeah. China has experienced the largest internal migration in human history. Nearly 160 million people, that's almost 12% of today's population, left rural areas to seek work in cities. The motivation to move was obvious. In 1978, everyone was poor. Rural incomes were less than 40% of urban ones. Suddenly, communist China threw open its doors and factories appeared in coastal towns where farmers could make more money in a month than in a year growing rice. Migrants moved from the poorest inland provinces such as Guizhou, Sichuan, and Anhui. In 1980, farmers here lived on less than $2 a day. According to Kao Ming Chan at the University of Washington, more than 10 million workers migrated out of their home province between 1990 and 1995. Another 32 million migrated from 1995 to 2000, and yet another 38 million over the next five years. By 2011, nearly 160 million rural Chinese were working far from home. Between 2001 and 2010, migration contributed nearly 20% of China's economic growth. But it has all come at a personal cost. Many migrants spent years away from their family. Industrialization has also caused a terrible pollution problem. Many feel the huge personal and national economic impact have made it worthwhile. In the 1990s, the wealth gap between rural and urban China opened wide. The gap has closed a little. This is still a huge social issue. With tens of thousands of cases of rural unrest each year. The city of Shenzhen, just over the border from Hong Kong, is a classic example of the speed at which Chinese cities have grown. Shenzhen has sprawled from a town of a few thousand in 1978 to a city of 12 million people in 2010 and it's set to keep on growing. The EIU forecasts that the population will hit 15 million by 2020. In just over 30 years, the GDP of coastal provinces such as Guangdong, where Shenzhen is located, has shot up. Two other coastal provinces, Zhejiang and Jiangsu, in 2010 had the same GDP as Austria and Switzerland, respectively. Now, though, as the cost of labor, land near the coast has risen, Manufacturing is moving inland. Fewer migrants are traveling to the coastal cities. As more jobs are created in inland cities and provinces, more wealth is trickling down to rural areas too. So this is a little bit of the background for what is happening. But economists need to tell a simplified story because except for the more income, actually the peasants they are looking for we are looking for a kind of uh, upgrade in social status. So that's why they are traveling to city, to experience the city life, because not only they are from a passive uh, household registration, uh, Chinese government started in, since uh, 1958, which means that they have to control the uh, internal traveling between cities and between villages. So they sign up everyone has to go to the government and the register their household. So um, for an urban identity, they will enjoy a lot of uh, privilege and benefits, like a free medical care in the city, and also uh, education. They can uh, go to some elite university for the next class. But for those passive uh, registration, they have to work really hard to get the 
because uh, the party is not really is not really using the Act to use to count uh, even though they have uh, an official trade union for a China Federation of Trade Unions. But it is not elected at all. It's simply like the United Organization between official uh, trade unions around the world. But whenever there's strike happening, it creates that balance. We can say anything about it. So, um, and of course, uh, nowadays, the change of labor landscape is happening in China, like uh, from Shenzhen to Beijing, <coughs> as I explained. So from the coastal area to the inland area. But the minimum wage will be different in big cities. So a lot of workers cannot survive. And we have to remember that those workers, sometimes they have their money in the city area. It's not easy for them to just leave the city they have been staying for years to work in the new environment. So that it calls a lot of conflicts between the workers and the employer. So from December 2013 to June 2014, it's very good in China, particularly. There's around uh, 400 strikes happening. Um, for some friends, you might know that uh, IBM was called the Lamps, but the strikes were the biggest night in the uh, But usually, this kind of strike is less organized. They just have it when their boss say uh, it's time to relocate that ship. Because this is very uh, under the 
situation. And it seems like the, the, the strike is uh, still ongoing. It happened in March, and that they have filed a lawsuit with uh, some lawyers to warn us. And uh, I don't know whether the, the court has, uh, has announced any outcome, but I think that we are making a good progress. And uh, I was afraid to show that all uh, the chairman of the union. <coughs> And also, uh, about three days ago, there's a report about uh, the 
all the teachers, they are also making this kind of news together and in their a new way to learn money. Uh, these two comments, especially the topic of some Chinese students, it is an over-seated for the development. Two guys are shipping hands. And in the back, the Chinese work are saving hands. And you can see that the yellow shirts guys are grabbing money from the blue shirts guys. So the blue shirts guys are representing uh, suppliers or factories in the corner. And the yellow shirts are the future. And the yellow shirts is uh, the red paper is in Chinese, uh, all, all the material all is red. So, uh, which means that the official letter uh, issued by the Edu uh, Education Bureau of China is uh, allowing workers to work in the household. Um, this kind of leadership is unfair, completely unfair. The reason is those workers are not majoring in any electronics related or engineering, they study music, they study tourism, they study hotel management, they study finance or business. So you can tell that it's simply a source for uh, cheap labor or even free labor. Those students, they also have to pay their internship fee to the school, they also have to pay their tuition fee to the school, but they earn less. So it's really ridiculous because they are not receiving any quality education. They have teachers stationed in the factory to do some kind of counseling, asking them to stay in the production line, not to be naughty, just to be good and follow the supervisor's uh, supervisor order. But they are not receiving anything with this uh, about uh, or time management in the factory. All they are doing is just uh, in service school in a little part of the machine and that's it for two years or one year. Uh, so it is indeed violating the Chinese labor law because they say they, they, they claim that you have to be you know, responsible or responsible to uh, under underage worker. Underage worker is those between 16 to uh, 15 years old. And then you have to make sure that they do not have time shift, they do not have overtime work. And uh, indeed force on I think mean that they do have to do meetings and they do have partnerships making PlayStation 4. This news happened in uh, October 2013. Uh, this is the first time of them to I think mean that they use student interns. And uh, why this is uh, only the public is because a lot of customers have think about the quality of PlayStation 4. So, the supplier and also Sony asked uh, Foxconn to investigate about it. And then also at that time, uh, some Chinese mainland reporter, uh, I don't know how, but he or she kind of managed to offer some kind of disturbing workers in that batch. So uh, the workers say, yeah, we are trying to destroy the machine because it's, we're so tired. You know? <laughs> Yeah, and maybe some of you have a very simple conversation. 
Chinese uh, university student across the school to not uh, source the computer with uh, toxic chemicals, and they did. So the contract was worth about 2,000 million. <coughs> Thank you. 
we should definitely chat like um, after this because we think that we can get a whole few people in each one of the sessions from our views of the Everything being said here is being captured on the camera.
we uh, can see him, but we cannot see him as far as us. So, yeah. So, he'll be doing this presentation, and I'll be giving him, giving him advice by Skype. Yeah, we will set up for this. But, okay, so uh, it's about to start, and then for the Q&A, if you have questions, I'll just write them on Skype, and he'll answer uh, on the camera, okay? Does that work? Uh, 
the more than uh, 3,000 of uh, disappeared uh, killed people, murdered people. Um, so uh, we defined it as a state terrorism really. And the military, together with, with right wing politicians and with the support of the United States of America, uh, built up a mechanic model which privatized the public services like uh, water, electricity, public funded housing, and social security. And it was uh, um, an economic model which uh, oriented, re oriented the whole economy toward the exploitation of natural resources, mainly minerals, forestry products, and fishing. Um, this, this new orientation of, of the economy meant nothing but dependence uh, on other countries like the United States. Um, also, the dictatorship economic politics created uh, new markets in housing, healthcare, and which is our topic today, education. Um, in political terms, it created a post political system which consolidated the partnership, the partisanship, sorry, of the radical right wing, which were members and, and creditors of the dictatorship political class, and the coalition, which is the, the, the political coalition of each of the um, this meant uh, a huge centralization of the political system, widening the, the gap between the social world and the political world. Um, regarding education, uh, some facts uh, or some changes that the dictatorship introduced were that, um, for example, state schools were no longer dependent on the state, but uh, on each local government. So uh, this created a segregated uh, school system, which um, has high-class school and low-class schools. Also, uh, the dictatorship has strengthened the private schools, which receive um, state funds, uh, becoming a huge business for, for a lot of businessmen who uh, currently and for the last 20 or 30 years uh, are um, um, gaining huge uh, amounts of money with the, with the business of education. Um, with respect to universities, the dictatorship ended the scale-based system, that is to say, um, in part of the dictatorship, you pay for you, you pay for the university um, in relation to, to your incomes, but uh, the dictatorship ended the system and it also stood up the national educational system and partially discontinued the financing of public universities. At the same time, uh, promoting the appearance of several private universities, which are where the most of the students currently uh, attend. Um, so after the dictatorship, we lived uh, in, a, in ages that were called the transition to democracy. And this transition, so-called transition, was led by a coalition of political parties, as I said, called the Coalition of Parties for Democracy. This coalition continued and deepened the model. So the consequences of the model have years and years of development. Um, so what are these consequences? Uh, the consequences are that in order to study, for example, children families go into millionaire debt with banks because of the high fees. So the, the only way to study in Chile is to uh, go into a debt with a bank and to end paying like four or five um, um, the, the original fee. So it's uh, a, really, uh, a really big problem which, uh, uh, which affects uh, the most of the students of Chile. And that's uh, not, not, that is not all. Uh, the selection system for universities also created a segregated educational system. So there are universities for rich people and universities for poor people. Um, thus, all these conditions generated the, the context or the climate for the emergence of the student movement as you probably know it. Uh, university students started organizing, 
student unions of student federation and the region, sorry, and different waves of demonstrations and struggling during the 90s and the first years of the 2000s uh, created this experience uh, of which the student movement uh, arose. Uh, certainly, some of you could remember the so-called Penguins Revolution led by secondary students. Well, this, this, all these struggles uh, give students for nation the legitimacy among students and converted students into a political actor. Um, this uh, this uh, fact of becoming a political actor means that uh, governmental authorities no longer can ignore what students have to say. Because, as I said before, the student demand for a free state funded education oriented toward the people needs instead of the market interests became a demand of the whole country. So, for example, um, according to some surveys, the education demands got around 70% of approval within the population, while Sebastián Piñera's government's approval and the traditional party's approval in general uh, went down. Um, so, um, the student movement also um, helped to put into, into movement the whole Chilean society, beaten by the model. Uh, so, uh, in the first years of the 2000s, other social movements emerged from the uh, emerged, like workers' movement, housing, environmental movements, among others, right? Um, all of these social movements changed in some way the expectations or the tolerance of Chilean people and changed the political world too because um, politicians must uh, change their speech and their programs trying to incorporate some of the demands of the social movements but without, without actually touching the foundations of the neoliberal system. So that's how we get to the current government which is the second uh, of each other today. Um, in few words, budgeted government is an attempt to decompress the social climate, and this can be seen uh, basically in two aspects. Uh, the first one is the incorporation of left-wing parties, including the Communist Party, to the government coalition, and is the lack of definition, dates, and concrete proposals of the government political program. Um, but also, we have to point out that, the, that this coalition, this government coalition, uh, is not a uniform coalition. So it, uh, it actually has many differences and struggles inside, struggles that, of course, uh, are for the content of the program. Um, therefore, there are politi different political lines within the, this uh, political coalition, right? Um, this is very important because uh, knowing the weakness of who we are facing, uh, we can organize better in our struggle, which is the struggle for one of the most essential social rights, the education. Um, recently, during her speech of May the 21st, Michelle Bachelet announced some of the keys of the reforms which, which the government will be promoting. These uh, the concrete projects which they have presented in the Congress tend to limit the excesses of the model, but uh, they do not redefine it in order to give it a new orientation. So it's basically the same neoliberal model in education and in all the aspects of uh, life but uh, with some laws which uh, will limit the, the excesses that uh, are those who, which affect uh, Chilean people, right? So um, we, as a student movement, have been very clear on these limits of the reforms of the government. Um, the reform not only doesn't touch the foundations of the model, but it also has been designed without the participation of the actors which are, uh, who are di directly affected by it. That is to say, uh, it was designed without the participation of students, of teachers, and other workers of education. So the problem with the, with the current government is not only about form, that is to say about participation, but it's also about content, about how and who is the knowledge developed for. 
right? Um, the National Student Confederation and the National Teachers Organization have their position against the reform. And what do we want is, um, uh, as I said, a state-funded, free and high-quality education, which in concrete terms uh, is translated into a national public educational system founded by the state as a guarantee of this social right and not only as a subsidiary state. Uh, we want this system to have strict requirements for those institutions which want to receive state funds. These institutions can profit from education, for example. These institutions will have to meet some requirements in terms of infrastructure, in terms of number of teachers per student, etc. But uh, we also want uh, to change the orientation of the education. We want an education which serves the needs of Chile, not that of the businessmen. So uh, this national system, we want, we want it to be oriented by a national development plan. And in that, in that sense, uh, we conceive an education which responds and helps to develop a different kind of country. We want a different education for a different country. Um, but um, being said that, uh, we as the uh, uh, as an organization think that that the struggle doesn't end there. Uh, we want a different kind of society, and for that, we need to generate the conditions which allow the people to organize and to grow the people's power. As I said before. Both the political and economic conditions are asphyxiated. For example, unions cannot organize at a national level thanks to our labor code. Citizens do not participate in the decisions of their own communities. And there is this complex legal code inherited by the from sorry, inherited from the dictatorship, which constricts the possibilities of social organization. At the same time, we understand that this model could be overtaken only from the inside because traditional political parties, managers, and the whole political system are designed in a certain way which makes almost impossible to change the foundations of the model. But uh, we, believe, we believe that with the strength of the social movements and exploiting the contradictions of the model, we can generate a rupture. Uh, and this rupture, this um, breakup of the model, will be charged of the democratic sense and the struggle of Chilean people. So, uh, to conclude, uh, we have several tasks to accomplish uh, during the following years. We have to help the social movements to develop. We have to face a government that wants to calm down people with deep changes. We have to generate concrete proposals which uh, go uh, farther than just the student movement. We have to generate a program with concrete proposals for, for the entire country. And it is going to be, and definitely it has been tough years, full of challenges for a young organization like ours. As I say, we only have um, 11 years. So we are learning in the process, but uh, I think that we are in the right direction, um, and the people's support confirm that. So um, that's that's it. I don't know if you have some questions or comments.
Yes, dental uh, estudiantes in the science works from. Uh, 
What effects have the elections uh, have the elections had on mobilizing the student movements, and what strategies have you found against the demobilization of students? Okay, um, in general terms, uh, elections uh, do you have the, the demobilization that we had expected they, they have? Um, in fact, um, despite this coalition, uh, uh, is trying to, to show it, uh, to, to show themselves like an uh, like alternative to neoliberalism. In particular, students uh, haven't uh, believed that because, uh, mainly because uh, the, 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 the main strategy that we, that we used in 2011 was to uh, try the conflict to stay open. That is to say, to, um, despite of not winning our demands, we win some of them, we want some of them, sorry, and, uh, but also we uh, maintain the, the goal of our uh, movement, which is the uh, free state funded education, which is itself um, a contradiction with the model. That is to say, neoliberalism is incapable to give people uh, a free education which is oriented toward the people needs. So the strategy is to uh, take advantage of the contradictions of the model and the contradictions between the necessities of the model and the necessities of people. Terms, the, I think the, 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 
the main thing or the key of these are not the words that we use, but the contradictions that we can exploit. In that sense, uh, I think it's not that important to talk about capitalism or neoliberalism, but to talk to people in terms that they understand. And of course, to the Chilean people is, uh, doesn't understand what capitalism is, and almost doesn't understand what neoliberalism is. Uh, Chilean people understand what their concrete conditions of living are, and in that sense, we have to, to, to talk to people in those terms. That's why I make this distinction, because uh, that's where we can start. It doesn't mean that we think that the struggle uh, starts and ends with neoliberalism, but it has to do that, that the struggle starts against neoliberalism, and um, um, as we develop the political consciousness and, 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 and people develop their own political consciousness, then we, we have the opportunity to deepen the struggles going, uh, uh, going uh, further, uh, the struggle against neoliberalism, so we can, uh, at some moment of history, face capitalism as a whole system and build up, uh, build up a different alternative to it. So this distinction in some, uh, this distinction has to do with uh, what people really understand and what people really feel uh, for struggling because it's important to understand that uh, people don't want to struggle. I mean, people struggle when they feel that they need to. And neoliberalism has reached a limit, and Chilean society knows that, and Chilean society is planning for a different kind of life. So uh, I think that we start with the struggle against neoliberalism, but the, the task of the, uh, the left wing organizations or the revolutionaries is to deepen those fights in the terms that people understand, because uh, it's people who make the changes in society, not us.
relates to techniques. So I was just wondering what you know your organizational structure is, how it works, and then also how you convince students and workers to come on board because particularly in the university setting, as we all know, there's incredibly high turnover rates and it's difficult to keep up the momentum when you're shedding um, people who could help and are direct, you know, uh, stakeholders, I guess, in the movement, more directly stakeholders in the movement um, every year. So techniques and recruiting and turnover to make organization with that better way to simplify it. Okay, um, first of all, I uh, need to, to make a distinction here because the, um, one thing is my political organization and another thing, our different thing, are the students' organizations, right? Um, my political organization has a structure that we call uh, uh, federalism, I think is the English term for that which means that we organize in groups which uh, collaborate together to build from the foundations uh, our political right. In that sense, it's a deep democratic organization because the decisions are made by the entire organization and as I said in my presentation, that's how we want the social movements to organize too. For example, um, for example, the student movements in universities organize itself um, from the faculties. Each faculty has a student's union, and that student's union uh, um, have, assemb have assemblies, assemblies or meetings where all the students uh, go together to to discuss their concrete problems and to give a solution to them. Um, it's important to understand that there is no recipe for, for that and that the most of the people in, in common universities uh, doesn't want to struggle or all the time. So the dynamic that we have to adopt is a dynamic where we uh, attend to students' needs, uh, necessities, and we confront these necessities with the actual conditions of the universities and the country. Um, it's in that contradiction where our comrades or our classmates um, uh, became more aware uh, about how society works. So the, the, the core of the political awareness for us is the actual experience that uh, that people uh, live. So, uh, regarding to our organization structure, I was saying that each faculty have a student union, and this student union uh, have their spokespersons, and these spokespersons uh, go together and organize them in a federation, which represents the our entire university. These variations uh, also coordinate uh, between each other into a national confederation. And in that sense, the student movement also has a, a federalist or kind of organization. That is to say, uh, when we have to make decisions, each faculty of each university in Chile discuss the problems and the reality of the education and generates proposals which go from the faculties to the federations and from the federations to the confederation, making uh, a decision at a national level. Of course, um, well, uh, it's impossible to have assemblies uh, every week, so we have to be intelligent and design democratic system which can be at the same time democratic and efficient. So
So that is the, the, the balance that we had to find and we think that um, until now uh, we have been successful doing that. Um, about my political organization, um, in 2011 we had a huge uh, growth of organization because of the role that we played in the mobilizations, right, and the demonstrations. Uh, we think that the, the best way to promote uh, people to enter to our organization or to recruit people is uh, with the example, the example of being the best students, of being uh, responsible toward uh, the organization and toward our classmates, and uh, being uh, uh, with each other. That is to say that um, we think and we are convinced that the real strength of the social movements uh, is on, on, on the students. I mean, uh, of course we represent uh, the students uh, in the federations or the students' unions or in the confederation, but the real strength uh, is in every student that go out to the streets when we um, call to demonstrations. In that sense, how do we recruit people for the social movements is uh, attending to the people needs, to the concrete needs of the students. Um, of course, uh, for example, in the 90s, it was unthinkable to propose or to demand a free education, but from 2000 to, to this year, it's unthinkable to, to demand other things that is not free education. In that sense, is is connected to the to other uh, questions that you can answer me, that you can question me, sorry, as well. Um, because it was this experience, the very experience of the hundreds of thousands of students during the post dictatorial years that uh, built up the organization that we have today. Uh, in the experience and the and the and facing the reality that uh, gives you the strength and the knowledge to 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 face it and to develop alternatives. Okay, thank you uh, for this uh, opportunity to share with you our experience and our uh, organization. Uh, thank you and I hope uh, you have a great uh, time and, and as we said here in Chile, Arriba los y la up those who fight.